Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel, and it's the uh, 12 o'clock block on a given Monday. We're talking about uh, Mina, Marco, and me on Energy on Mondays, and we have the whole the whole array here today. Uh, welcome back to the show, Mina Marita. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi, Marco. Hi, Jay. Nice Hi. to be back. <laughs> Hi, Marco. How are you? Well, greetings from uh, the, one of the lava capitals of the world here on the beautiful Big Island of Hawaii. <laughs> Let's turn to that first. Let's turn to what's happening in the Big Island in terms of energy. And I guess the first thing which people may or may not be really focused on is what is happening with uh, Pune Geothermal Venture, PGV, um, and what are the problems that are uh, emanating from that? Well, it's a pretty, pretty dicey time right now, uh, guys, in that uh, the uh, fissures, which have been, uh, they're now over 20, have been pretty much in a straight line along the so-called East Rift Zone downslope of Kilauea. And up until uh, just in the past uh, handful of hours or so, the lava erupting from these fissures had been making a right turn going downslope, and eventually over the weekend they got to the, the ocean there uh, south of, of Kapoho, lower Puna, and are now uh, in the water. L lava is actually in in entering into the water. So just recently, in the past 10 or 12 hours, the uh, fissures closest to the perimeter line of Puna Geothermal Venture has been uh, uh, erupting lava and actually going to the northwest. And the northwest is in the direction of the facility, of the wellheads of the buildings. So uh, there's a, a team that's been out there for days. Uh, I know uh, uh, Tom Travis, a former uh, naval officer and tapped by David Egate to be the head of Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. Tom is very much involved. And uh, it's really kind of high, high uh, stress right now because uh, they are working actively to try to cap three active wellheads uh, prior to the possibility of the wellheads being overrun by lava. So I can only imagine the degree of stress and anxiety that uh, people are experiencing there, actually working on the scene, and uh, you know, add that to the the continuing uh, uh, belching of uh, hydrogen sulfide gas, sulfur dioxide gas, and then when the lava is hitting the ocean, interacting with salt water, is producing hydrochloric acid gas along with gra uh, glass crystals, which are carried can be carried miles and miles and miles south. Uh, depending on the uh, the strength of the prevailing trade winds. So, you know, I don't want to sound too alarmist, but I mean, like so many people here on this island, I've been watching the news on a, on a very regular basis, and uh, I'm feeling a degree of an anxiety myself in terms of, uh, gosh, you know, and all the, the impact it's having on hundreds and hundreds of families and structures destroyed and lives disrupted. And, uh, you know, I think we all know, anybody who lives on the Big Island, uh, has had the background of volcanic activity for decades and decades and decades. But when there's relative quiescence in terms of not a whole lot of action, and then something like this happens where the earth literally opens up for a stretch of miles and belches lava like flowing water, it's, uh, it, it's, it's sobering and it's, uh, it causes us uh, as human beings to see just how tiny and infinitesimal we are vis-a-vis -vis the, the force of uh, these primal forces of nature. Is it getting worse? Well, uh, from what I understand, the lava that's been flowing relatively recently is new lava compared to old magma going back decades that is essentially being uh, reheated, so to speak, and, and was the first lava to come out of the ground. But the new lava, the newer lava, newer magma is less viscous. It's, it's runnier in a sense and is, is uh, traveling over uh, distance at a, at a faster clip. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's just kind of awe-inspiring and, and scary at the same time. And, uh, you know, PGV went down in terms of power production over two weeks ago. That's uh, something more than 30 megawatts, and now that's not chump change in terms of the, uh, the percentage that uh, PGV used to provide to HELCO. Uh, for their daily firm, re firm power requirement generation. So Helco has had to go elsewhere to their own units 
uh, that they usually don't operate in order to make up that shortfall. And I don't know if they've been able to get more out of the biggest plant on the island, which is Kehole, uh, right close to the airport, or Hamakua. Uh, Hamaku Energy, which is in Honoka, which is the second largest plant. I don't know if they've been maxing those out or not. Uh, I think, from what I understand, we're relatively okay in terms of generation, adequate generation to meet demand. But then again, uh, we're at a lower, we're at a time of the year when demand is less. As we get into the winter months, the demand increases during peak time. So uh, I'm not privy enough at this point to to know just how close of a margin we have right now in terms of generation being able to meet demand. Uh, what's the uh, d demand for the, the Big Island? It's about 150 megawatts peak right now, 150. So 30% thir is going to be 20% of the entire the entire Correct. demand right there. Correct. Yeah, uh, th I mean 30 um, uh, megawatts. Actually, I think it's more like 38 or something like that. So it's actually a higher percentage yet. Yes. So um, you know the the, the thing that uh, that uh, you, we mentioned this you mentioned this before the show began, and it's really interesting is that. <laughs> Um, wouldn't wouldn't the lava have the effect of, of capping um, capping the well? Uh, why do you have to cap it in advance of the lava arriving? Wouldn't the lava just cover it up? Well, kind of intuitively that makes sense, Jay. But I, I'm not enough of a I, I, I'm, I'm ignorant on the subject fundamentally to offer much of a much of a, a wise opinion, but I mean, if uh, people like Tom Travis uh, with the governor's backing and, uh, and PGB and, and Harry Kim, civil defense, if they came to the conclusion days ago, which they did, which the best thing is to, to effectively kill these wellheads, these three wellheads, then that would indicate that they weren't sanguine with the notion that if the lava were to overflow the facility, that the lava would simply cap the wellheads and they wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah, but it may not cap it perfectly. What do I get out of this is it may not cap it perfectly. There may be places where the, the gas can escape. Um, and uh, if that's the geothermal product can escape, and then what you have is a, an inability to cap it, and it's still escaping. And then you have, then you have a problem to the environment and to you know the community around it. I mean, it, w d confirm with me on that. If it escapes, if it is not capped, if it's flowing out into the atmosphere, the geothermal, geothermal, what is it, gas or, or liquid, whatever it is, um, you know that that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand, you know, the two main troublesome, troublesome components are sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, which are both. You know, they're not poison, poison, poison to breathe, but as the concentration goes up, people with respiratory illnesses especially could be very, very adversely affected. And as people were talking about Pune Geothermal back in the mid to late 1980s, uh, prior to the plant going online in 1993, so it's been in operation for about 25 years, they did, uh, you know, worst case scenario planning. And the worst case scenario planning assumed the possibility of a runaway well which would cause, which would, you know, effectively be uncapable, which would pollute the surrounding area to a radius of, of a number of miles, even perhaps going as far as KAO. Again, I don't want to be alarmist here, but as the plans for PGV were being considered by local authorities, by the state, by the feds, I mean, this is one of the considerations. So, again, not being an expert on it, uh, I do know that, uh, you know, there's worst case really, really nasty stuff that can, can happen. So, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, God willing, that that won't happen. Yeah. Well, this is, this is going to have a bad effect one way or the other on PGV and in a business sense and in the sense of trying to, um, you know, resurrect its systems and operate again. That doesn't sound like they can come back online anytime soon. Um, I think they're done. They're done, Jay. I mean, uh, think of it this way. What insurer at this point would possibly insure a facility that sits within spitting distance of a live lava fissure? Yeah, sure. I mean, we and we always knew there was a risk, and I and I'm wondering if people are saying, and not, not only on a cultural level, you know, we can we can get to that, but on the level of, gee, wasn't this always something that could happen? We always knew that the, the you know the downside of uh, geothermal is that uh, it comes from seismic activity, and if the seismic activity you know gets out of control, then it doesn't work anymore. 
Uh, people have been saying that for a long time, haven't they? Has the, you know, you mentioned that people have been, um, you know, complacent about it, but gee, uh, we've always known this was a risk, right? Well, I mean, look at it this way as well, Jay. You have uh, housing developments in this lava one zone, which is considered to be the most risky in terms of potential lava or, or volcanic activity. You've had building going on there for the past 50 or so years. The last eruptions around the east uh, rift, in terms of substantial eruptions and lava flow making to the sea, were going back to 1955 and 1960. Leilani Estates, which is one of the most affected areas, I, I believe that, that housing development was started in the mid-1960s. So year after year goes by, decade after decade goes by, there's no eruption. People build lives, they build homes, they cultivate the land. And all with, you know, you want to call it complacent and ignorance or, or something in between. It's just that you get used to the habituation of life being normal. Yes, you know in the back of your mind you're living in a volcanically active zone, but at the same time, like I said, year after year, decade goes by, you're fine. You deal with earthquakes and until something like this happens, the earth opens up and spews lava and destroys homes and destroys lives. Yeah, and destroys power sources. Um, yep. You know, uh, Hawaiian Electric or Hawaiian, Hawaii Electric Light Company going to have to, um, if, if you say it's done, if it's finished, then they're going to have to make permanent arrangements to, um, you know, find replacement sources. Uh, those may be fossil fuel sources for now. Uh, maybe there'll be other renewables coming online that can take the place of this 38 megawatts. But sounds to me like uh, they're going to have to move in that direction if they aren't already moving in that direction. Well, they're doing a 20 megawatt RFP request for proposal right now. Uh, but the, even if they were to get full solicitation and bring on 20 megawatts in a relatively short amount of time, assuming the loss of 35 megawatts or so from PGV, uh, the net effect, uh, unless and until um, Huonua comes online right up in Pepe Kea, which will be a biomass plant sometime sometime next year or later this year, uh, the, the end result is that Helco's renewable portfolio percentage will go down. Mm, yeah. And the other thing is that if somebody came around in, in, you know, in the next few years, I expect, whatever happens with the eruption right now, um, you know, um, there's going to be a certain amount of resistance. And you can say resistance on a practical level, on a liability level, insurance level, but also on a cultural level. I'm sure there are people who are saying, you know, we told you Pelly didn't like this. This was never good for Hawaii. And uh, we would oppose any, any attempt to reconnect it. Don't you think they'd say that? My hit in, in the 18 years I've been living here full time is that uh, the prospects of additional geothermal uh, being developed on this island are effectively dead, even prior to what's happened the past several weeks. There you have it. Well, okay, what, what, are your well, comments, what are your comments on this, Mina? Well, first of all, I think there are different kinds of geothermal plants, so let's not just write off geothermal in one fell swoop. And um, I, you know, I, I don't know too much about the technology, but I mean, you have to look at other areas that have um, successfully integrated geothermal um, into their systems um, without much um, cultural backlash and um, the problems that we face right now, you know, namely New Zealand and Iceland. So, um, so again, it, you know, it's, it's I, I think there's still potential, but definitely, you know, location is everything. Um, and, and my understanding is there's new uh, lower temperature um, geothermal technology that, you know, people were looking at on um, the slopes of Haleakala. I mean, you know, these are still, again, um, technologies that we may not be too familiar with um, um, because PVG has been prominent in, in discussions, but, you know, I, 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 I don't see a... Um, distinct end for, for geothermal in Hawaii. Uh, um, okay. I, I, think the I think the lesson here 
is the imper- the importance of diversity mm. um, and and having um, not being fully reliant on one single source for for energy. Um, and you know this is an important point to make. I mean, you know, you just look at the amount of rain that we've had on Kauai, and you know, had it taken out um, a hydroelectric plant, or what we've seen, you know, the long duration of rain and heavy um, overcast, and the impact it had on solar output and the uh, um, uh, charging ability of of, of batteries mm-hmm. for for yeah. storage. Right. So, so again, and then and you know and we we face challenges with wind. You know, with the diminishing trade wind. So we can't rely on one single source. I mean, we have we to have diversity. diversity. Yeah. By the way, uh, you guys, I am actually going to Iceland, and I'm I'm going to mm-hmm. be looking at the geothermal in Iceland. Um, and I'll give you a full report uh, when I come back. Mina Marita, Marco Mangelsdorf, we're going to take a short break so I can review some travelogues about Iceland, and then we'll be right back. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by, and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by, and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sounds. I like this music. So we do it. Hey, aloha, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy. I host a program called Security Matters Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us on Fridays. Uh, We air at 10 a.m. And we're going to be talking about those security things that really should be important to you. And, you know, maybe get behind the scenes on some some things that you may not know about the industry or about products or even about your habits. Um, Security is all about people, processes, and products, and we hope to bring that to you in an informative and um, hopefully a useful way. So again, 10, 10 a.m. on Fridays, Security Matters Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live. Well, we're recording anyway with Mina Marita and Marco Mangelsdorf. Uh, and we're talking about energy here on a Monday, and uh, we have been discussing the volca- volcan- volcano and, um, and the eruption uh, and its effect on energy in the Big Island. Um, and our internet went down, but we're still going to create this show right now. And the second part of the show we had contemplated was a discussion of the performance standards uh, PUC docket and statute, for that matter, uh, calling for an evaluation and a move toward performance standards by the utility, in this case, the utility is Hawaiian Electric and its subsidiaries. So, Mina, uh, you first. 
Uh, what does this signify? What does it tell us? Well, uh, it, <laughs> it, for me, it signifies the, um, the politics of renewable energies and um, where some of the discussion that happened at the legislature or, or the knowledge on what constitutes performance space regulation and cost of service regulation is not well understood by the legislature. Um, so, you know, basically I saw the bill as very political and I see the PUC's opening order as something to um, kind of calm the, um, the, what could have been a really bad situation for Chico with regards to um, financing and, and the financial market. Oh, yeah. So this, this could have an effect on uh, ECO's ability to raise money in the financial markets if it is seen as okay. a, a political attack on ECO. Right, and not only, not only on HECO, but also how it uh, would have impacted independent power producers whose um, interest rates are dependent on, on HECO. Okay, is it, less of, is it less of an attack now? I mean, is, is what the PUC is doing a more moderate well, approach? Well, I think, I, I, I think first of all, um, that the PUC's order is well, very thoughtful, well laid out. And um, and uh, in uh, in sort of outlining the the ups and downs of uh, performance based regulation, and it's not that Hawaii doesn't have performance based regulation. We have elements of it from um, uh, uh, previous actions that the PUC have taken. But to say that performance based regulation can replace um, the traditional cost of service um, regulation, I think, is very naive. Well, can you explain that? What is what is exactly the difference? Um, and um, you know, why why can you not make performance the single standard? Well, you know, the thing is, it's sometimes it's very hard to lay out the the, the performance standards that you're going to. Um, judge or rate the, the utility by. I mean, this is one of the reasons why performance-based regulation isn't um, wholeheartedly adopted by, um, by, the, by the regulator. I mean, it, it, it's, you have to come up with specific benchmarks that you're going to rate the utility uh, and their ability to um, uh, uh, Earn their earnings. Yeah. Um, do, do we know what those yeah. benchmarks are? Do you have some well, examples for us? Well, right now the the, the benchmarks that's used by um, the regulator are um, the 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 re, um, SADI, SAFI, and I can't remember what this stands for. <laughs> SADI, SAFI. You know, these are the kind of the reliability standards, and then also customer service through um, um, their call centers, how fast they respond to calls and stuff like that. Well, as you know, it and strikes then, me this is very hard. You say performance. Uh, I mean, first of all, you've got to identify what elements of performance you care about. So let's say it's mm -hmm. how fast they respond to calls. Let's say it's how reliable are they. It's hard to quantify uh -huh. that. It's hard to put right. that in a formula and say, well, you, you know, you're, you're good, you're bad, you're in the middle, whatever it is. Uh, and it strikes me that um, you know, this is going to be um, a fits and starts experience. It's going to be a, a trial and error experience. So like building a business model, you have to test yeah. it against the reality. You have to see how, how yeah. well it works. And you need a, a fair amount of time uh, to develop the experience necessary um, you know, to, to hone it down to, re, you know, reality. Marco, what do you think right. about the standards? What kind of standards uh, will be discussed? What will be appropriate? Is this workable? I wanted to say that I'm, I support Mina's observation in terms of the, uh, what uh, our friend Joe Viola, who's VP of Regulatory Affairs for Hawaiian Electric, said in uh, response to the, the, the ECO provided the commission last week. 
on this docket, which is docket 2018-0088, and he noted uh, the quote unintended consequences of going in this direction. Now, just because there, I mean, there's all sorts of unintended consequences in life. We know about that for sure. But what I'm struck by is that here you have this private company, Hawaiian Electric Industries, the parent company, Pico Health, Omiko, and American Savings Bank. You have effectively the legislature in the state, you have the governor of the state, you have the public utilities commissions of the state, who have all decided to one degree or another that Hawaiian Electric needs to fundamentally change its business model. And as a small business owner, just in principle, I have to say that gives me a little bit of heartburn. Not to say that we shouldn't continue with the docket, we should, but it opens a bit of a floodgate for multiple parties. And right now on this docket, assuming that the commission accepts all the petitioners, we would have 11 petitioners plus the commission and the consumer advocate. So let's say this is a uh, lucky 13, okay? 13 parties over the next month, over the next 9, 12, 18 months, who will be trying to come up with some type of consensus approach to trying to get Hawaiian Electric to fundamentally change their business model, where, to my knowledge, no other state in the country has done something like this. Rhode Island's looking at it, Minnesota's looking at it, New York's looking at it, other states are looking at it, but who has actually done it? So I, I reiterate what Joe Viola said in his, in his uh, letter to the, the commission last week. I think the unattended, unattended consequences, at least of which is the possibility of what effect is this going to have on Hawaiian Electric's ability to raise capital, which they need to do by, you know, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars for grid modernization and other projects. What effect is this process going to have on Hawaiian Electric, its ability to raise capital, and its shareholders? And we are really sailing into uh, to, to, to a new ocean here in terms of what kind of seas we're going to see, what kind of strange creatures will be coming up from the deeps and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that, um, you know, you both said is it's going to affect uh, Hawaiian Electric's ability to raise uh, funding in the capital markets. If that's so, if Hawaiian Electric has to pay more money uh, for funding in the capital markets, it's... It's going to have to pass that along to the consumers. Therefore, um, right. th this could be very disruptive on rates, don't you think? Oh, definitely. I mean, that, that's what just kind of turned my stomach when I read the legislation on this, that, uh, you know, the proponents of this legislation just didn't understand the impact on the rate payers should they put um, Hawaiian Electric's credit, credit rating in in jeopardy. I mean, the, the ultimate cost is borne by, by the rate payer. Yeah, well, so I think what we have here is the beginning of a long conversation, I mean, among the three of us. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I know one thing I, I, I remember is that when this first was discussed publicly, uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, indicated that it, it felt uh, that, it, you know, it would, it would help, it would cooperate, it would participate in the conversation to follow. And I think that's a very politic response. But, um, you know, what is the conversation to follow? Uh, is this going to be, you know, you mentioned the, um, you know, the, uh, the underpinning of the bill was that it was very political. Uh, is the conversation to follow going to be political? Is it going to be a continuation of, uh, you know, all the controversial uh, aspects of, of the next era deal and before that of the uh, of, of rate making and and solar I mean it got very controversial there in that period of time are we gonna have that again what is the conversation to follow gonna look like Marco uh, I think it's gonna be nothing but political okay I think it's gonna be heavily infused with politics and uh, along with economics so how it's gonna shape up uh, uh, we're, again, I think we're really going uh, in, in, into uncharted waters here in terms of how it's going to play out in the months to come. And again, I don't uh, begrudge the commission at all to, to look into it. And with uh, Jenny Potter coming on board in a little more than a month, uh, that's Jay, um, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, and Randy Iwase, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a strong lineup to, uh, to tackle this really cutting-edge stuff. Yeah, this is a... 
It's a policy wonk's dream is what it is. And you got two policy wonks on the commission as it stands. I mean, the new, the new members of the commission. And ultimately, the burden is going to fall on them to come up with solutions that somehow satisfy the expectations of the legislature, but don't damage the utility. What do you think, Mina? Well, I think, you know, the burden is going to fall on the chair and how, how the docket is going to proceed. Um, in looking at the opening order, um, I find it, I, I want to be optimistic because they talked about having um, these technical workshops and stuff. And um, that's going to be critical in getting um, all of the players, the utility, the cons consumer advocate, and the interveners on the same page. Um, and how these workshops are facilitated is going to be critical because I think they need a strong, unbiased facilitator that can lead the discussions rather than people just advocating for their positions. Yeah. Um, I, I thought that uh, Joe Viola letter um, was good, especially when they asked the PUC to lay out its guiding principles for this docket. Yeah. That's going to be critical. So a lot of it is dependent on the, um, the, the chair and how they proceed in these technical workshops. Yeah. Um, um, you know, in, in the in the last couple of years, you know, they've had these kinds of technical workshops on other issues, but it wasn't facilitated by the PUC. And where my understanding, um, you know, there were areas that there were problems going on, but nobody to kind of step in and um, bring all the parties back to the main issues, the guiding principles yeah. in, in, in um, steering the course. Yeah. At the end of the day, it, at the end of the day, uh, this is a, a big test of the efficacy of the PUC to deal with uh, right. what happened here. Marco, closing words for you. We only have a minute left. Yeah, Mina mentioned uh, facilitator, and uh, you know, Hawaiian Electric has a very keen interest in terms of having some say in who that facilitator will be, and I think rightly so. And uh, I think there's also uh, would be some concern if I was Hawaiian Electric in terms of what what's the discovery period going to be like in uh, in the phase one of, of of projected nine months. I mean, in terms of the information requests flying like fur from uh, from the multiple parties. I mean, could make the next era gig look like something of a tea party. Even oh, my goodness. <laughs> <interveners>. So <laughs> I think it's going to be wild and crazy. Oh, my goodness. I hope we can keep a lid on it, uh, just as we should keep a lid on uh, PGV. So this show has been about keeping a lid on things. Thank you so much, Marco Mangelsdorf and Mina Marita. Two weeks hence, we'll be back, and these subjects will still be fresh.